Hello, everyone. Um, uh, I don't know what you all think. I think probably we should start roundabout now I, and let the lecture hall fill up as we go. Do you, do you think? Everybody uh, happy we do that? Um, I'm Keith Priest. I'm the invisible president of the, um, of the AA because I'm off sorting out things to do with, uh, nothing to do with architecture most of the time. And very, very occasionally I get let out to do something I like to do and tonight's one of those occasions. Um, uh, it really is, uh, I know everyone says this, but this really is a great personal pleasure to introduce you to um, Paul Williams. I've known Paul uh, for many, many, many years and to connect it back into the school and life at, at the school I first came across um, Paul, when he was doing tents at the Tate, uh, what looked to me like medieval tents in the forecourt of uh, uh, Tate. And where I live in southwest London, one of my great friends is a painter, and she has a wonderful studio designed by Paul and uh, uh, Alan. And I can say, if you drew a five mile radius around that studio, it's probably the best building within five miles at, at, at least. Um, very modest building, uh, a wonderful building. But I think Paul's going to take some time out to talk to you about a grander project and uh, it's only one of their grander projects. And uh, uh, Paul and Alan, uh, for me, seem to me to disprove the uh, uh, to disprove the adage that you've got to be nasty to get on, because you couldn't meet two nicer guys, and uh, they've built this wonderful practice. And uh, I think we're going to be lucky enough tonight to get some insights into. Um, uh, what they've been doing at Central St. Martin's, which he insists on calling CSM. Um, but uh, uh, Central St. Martin's, great institution, uh, doing wonderful things across lots of sectors. And I think Stanton Williams' work there is going to be putting them to the test in that the going to be put on their metal by this building uh, and that they won't be able to live on their past, they're going to have to live on their present and uh, I think it's, it's quite an interesting model. Uh, but I think we should be aware that somehow this is one of the things that they manage to fit in amongst Sainsbury Laboratories winning Sterling Prizes. Uh, colleges in Oxford, uh, uh, this, this is a, uh, a very, very large-scale undertaking. So as Paul goes through what he's been doing here and giving us the insights into um, their work at uh, CSM, uh, it's, I think you should bear in mind that it's taking place against a, a sea of phenomenal work and the quality across that range of work is phenomenal and the diversity of that, way, that work is phenomenal. So it really is a fantastic pleasure to see um, Paul here and to introduce him and I'll shut up and uh, let you let the pictures do the talking. Paul Williams. Good evening. Oh, Keith's staying. He's running out, you were saying, in there. Okay. Um, right. We're uh, very quickly, I don't know whether how many of you know about Stanton Williams. We're not uh, uh, one of the star architects that um, are talked about quite a lot. Uh, what I'm going to start off by doing, though, is just showing you a quick film of Central St. Martin's done by the students, because ultimately this project is somewhat different to other projects we've worked on 
which is much more. We pulled back quite a lot on this project to allow the occupier, the staff and the students, to create their own identity within it. But what's wonderful about working with a, a client uh, like Central St. Martin's, that of course is part of the University of the Arts, is that there is a, a creative dynamic within it. The question is, and that was a title that uh, I gave a lecture some time ago, whether architecture is, um, you know, whether or not it's a straight jacket or, or not, or whether it's just a framework, it's a facilitator, or whether it actually stops you doing things. And this was the big worry with the brief that we were given uh, at the start of this project uh, by Jane Rapley, who said that the one given about Central St. Martin's is that whatever they are on day one, they have no intention of being on day two. So when you think about yourselves as designing something, you know, we talk about briefs and with aspirations of clients. We're looking here at a building type that actually s doesn't stop them evolving in time. But I'll, I just want to start off with the, uh, the film that they made. I'm not sure how many of you might have seen it. Have you got the, uh, you've lost the film somewhere along the line. Sorry. I am going to, I, I, we, we can dispense with this if we want to the film, but I, what I think is nice is that it is images that, um, you have one next to that one. Most probably. this was working a little bit earlier. Um, I don't know how many of you have um, read The Guardian this week uh, and what it has on the architecture of the blog. Um, it's showing uh, four interviews by fairly well-known architects. I don't know whether you've seen this. It's Rem Coolhouse, um, Foster, Richard Rogers, and Zaha Hadid. And I recommend 
that you all you all look at this because it actually has the four practices actually presenting their work to a panel uh, for a sort of skyscraper in Park Avenue. And whenever architects actually come together, and I'm sure Keith will uh, accept this, when, when you know who your shortlisted um, adversaries are, for want of a better word, clearly within an interview you're starting to talk about why a certain type of architecture that somebody else does is not appropriate. Um, Lord Foster, Norman, he said in this interview, he talks about to be distinguished and noticeable and notable. This building doesn't have to indulge in a look at me hysteria, one wonders who he's talking about here, of sculpted shapes or so on. Now, I have to say, when I hear uh, Norman Foster talking about that, I it very much chimes with Stanton Williams. When Al and I set up the practice uh, 25 years ago, uh, 27 years ago in fact, you know, we've never really aspired to have the buildings, the, um, the shiny objects that appear on the horizon, which uh, Norman's talking about, aiming to impress uh, through an outstanding singular shape, seeking a powerful external, uh, external form with little respect for the content internally. For us, buildings don't actually have to shout at all. For us, it is about the internal programs. It is about moving from inside to outside, which is always critically any building has to understand the interior, and obviously the context is important as well. But when you uh, look at this, our work, and I am not going to focus on the, the Sainsbury Lab or uh, the earlier work, I am going to focus on CSM, for us, St at Stanton Williams, we're very much to do with sort of sensory realism. It is about touch, it is about feel, it's not about conceptual I idealisms, and that's fundamental to the work that... Um, we've always run a very different course. I'm going to just get this out, and I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about the ethos of Stanton Williams, then I'm going to get on to uh, Central St. Martins. But our aim has always been and continues to be to create sustainable solutions, spaces that work within their physical and cultural environment and context. And I use this word appropriate, but an architecture that's appropriate. That's not to say at times that iconic architecture isn't appropriate, but it has to be fit for purpose and place. And uh, Irene Scalbert, an architect historian that who actually went to the... Uh, AA talked about um, Stanton Williams as a practice and he said that we always strive and are always striven for total architecture advocated by Gropius and Taut, you know, in the Bauhaus in the uh, 1920s which is a synthesis of all design disciplines including furniture and fittings. Now it's most probably all of you, all of us here, I'm sure Keith would, we all aspire to total architecture ideally if we have a client that wants to um, uh, pay us to do that, clearly we want to control all of it. And I think in truth, with respect to our early work, which was all to do with art galleries, museums, a lot of uh, retail, because we couldn't get building work in those early days. For five years, Alan Stanton and I hadn't built anything. The first building was actually the studio that Keith referred to in South London. So it took a long time, but we were working on exhibition work on Izumaki and those sort of projects, but they do required total visual control. So you've got to imagine we've come out of that, that demand of actually controlling everything. When you take your clothes off in a changing room, through to how you look in a mirror, how you come out of a changing room, how you walk to the end of the shop, because Izumaki always used to talk about he sells his clothes by the way the clothes contact with the body. He always talked about himself as an architect because architects ultimately, clothing is the first form of architects. He designs the space between the cloth and the skin. So, you know, we're coming from uh, this early work when Miyake gives us a brief by handing us a jacket, saying, feel that jacket, and this was in Paris the first time we confronted him, and he just said, feel the jacket, that's what I want. That was his first brief for the first man's shop. 
So we're coming very much from that sensory early project about the quality of space and how people move through space, how we touch space, threshold, rough to smooth, solid to soft, all of those sort of sensory. Palasma talks about the mother of all senses is touch and we, I think we aspire to that as well. And I think importantly um, with the project you're going to see we have pulled back much more. This project at Central St. Martins is not about having that exact finish at all. The Sainsbury Laboratory clearly as I said earlier is, is much greater. We designed the furniture, we looked at door handles and we're working on those as well. It's all considered but importantly even within that very considered architecture there's a very extremely flexible interior structure. Um, anyway, I think I, I only want to make this point about ultimately Central St. Martins is a student experience and that's what's driven everything. You know, the students and staff are now the participants of this building you're going to see. Now, ultimately, they're the ones that have to articulate it and take it on and when Keith was saying it's up to them now, it is very much up to them. We've provided the stage for transformation. We've allowed the flexible spaces that allow the college latitude. And by latitude, I mean spaces that can evolve and change over time. And obviously, teaching methods will change in that time, but importantly, within this organizing architectural framework. I think that, just coming back to that, that is the scheme that, in fact, 2002, uh, we won uh, against an international field of architects to develop the site. I don't know how many of you went to Central, you know, seen Central St. Martins at Holborn, but we took away the Cochrane Theatre and on the top right hand corner you can see the 12 story building that we developed um, on that site facing Red Lion Square. And we had to dig down in the ground, just uh, obviously there were underground tubes running underneath, but we managed to create a theatre in the lower ground floor. Now, shortly after winning the competition in 2002, King's Cross. Um, I'm be interested to know, have many of you visited Central St. Martins at all? Have many of you been to King's Cross? You, um, not sure how many people. King's Cross is a development that, as it said there, it's 67 acres brownfield site. Uh, it will have, it's got 8 million square feet when it's developed out. It will have 50 new buildings. 20 buildings of historic significance are going to be redeveloped. They're going to be the homes there that we talk about, public spaces, new streets, and enhanced Regents Canal. The question is, if you were embarking on a project that is bringing 4,000 plus people, students, to that area, would you be willing to be the first people on the site? And that was the question that University Arts had to take on. They could have had the Red Lion Square site that I just showed you, we won the competition, but one of their uh, governors listened to Roger Madlin from Argent, who are the developing the site, and Roger said, we have all these buildings on the site, we have 20 historic buildings, uh, they're looking for reuse. Um, and it was uh, a guy called Don Grattan who came back and said, we really need to look at this, we should ask Stanton Williams to hold on the development of the Holborn site and explore the potential of King's Cross, which we did. And what's fascinating, that's the building we looked at, which is the Granary Building, built in 1851 by uh, Lewis Cubitt, the same architect that uh, built uh, King's Cross Station. And of course, what became very apparent very early on is if you're thinking about an art college, uh, would you rather have a, a tall, very high building with 12 storeys or would you prefer to have a four-storey building with horizontal connections and strong links? And obviously the, the links through to St Pancras, King's Cross. You're at a very major transport interchange. However, you are first on the site. The uh, governors decided that they would... Um, they're willing to be the first inhabitants at King's Cross and hence this is the building that we've now developed. You can see the uh, granary building. I, one thing I didn't bring is a pointer. Do we have a pointer? Uh, Regent's Canal. Here we have that the basin that uh, obviously had water in it one side. We designed the canal boat to the time and all the drain from the uh, Lincoln 
field would have been uh, brought the grain down and then the grain would have been either stored in this granary building or it would have then been sent off on the barges to the um, bakeries around London. That's sort of the condition of the building. The red line represents the site that we had to uh, experiment. It won't turn off. Right, okay. Rather careful with that. So here we have the canal. Here the granary building. These are the transit sheds where the trains would have come in, bringing their, uh, the, with the wagons and the grain, they would have moved through this building and they would have popped out at this side going back to the north. These are the transit sheds in the middle and that's the area that we actually took out in order to build the new studio buildings. This is the, uh, called the Western Handersides Canopy. Now again, if you're looking at uh, this as the potential for this site, what is remarkable is that this most probably now is the last undeveloped footprint in London. There's nothing that uh, has the sort of acreage that this site has. By Central St. Martins being first there, they now have the use of this, um, this Western Heights canopy for two months of the year. We have the square at the front end again. This is all areas where they can exhibit and they can actually use for large chunks of the year. There is nowhere in London, anywhere else, that you could develop horizontally in this sort of way. So uh, again, coming back to the decision of the governors, clearly this is a relatively easy choice to make. So that was the building I was looking at. There's the granary building, transit sheds, the scheme. We removed the um, central area. We opened up and refurbished both the transit sheds and we refurbished the granary building itself, putting in a light well here. We agreed with Camden and English Heritage on the height of the building that was appropriate within this listed building because this is a grade two listed building. We then built the studios within, created a central street and a performance center to the north, which plugs into, which will be the first public uh, route, the first uh, road that allows cars into it. All the rest of the side of King's Cross actually is uh, uh, public transport only, taxis and buses and bikes. So for us, um, you know, two scenarios. One, we have, we, we've got the students that are working, and remember it's an art school. So this is not a building that was ever going to be precious. It couldn't be precious. It's very different to a lot of our other projects. It had to have a robustness. And these are the sort of the design concepts. This is what we talked about with the client very early on. I, you can read that for yourself. But importantly, they wanted to encourage public interaction at the same time. These are the uh, cross-section, again, of the two studio buildings, and these are the transit sheds that we're working on. But they wanted large floor plates with a few columns. It's a, ro it's a warehouse that they've effectively created on the site with as much natural daylight as possible and social interaction. Clear divisions between studios and workshops. And, of course, the beauty of moving into a building like this, it, it was a glorified workshop anyway, so we've put all the heavy workshops into the historic part of the building, which seems appropriate. Of course, there's massive potential now for exhibitions and performance spaces. And that just focuses on the light. But when you're working on these projects, and uh, I'm sure with the projects you work on, at the end of the day, you've got to understand adjacencies. Um, you've got to think about the movement, not only of 4,000 students going through this building, but you also have to think about the materials that are being delivered to the building. It is a sausage machine. You have students coming in at one end, which is cut through here, but, and we have the performance center here, but we've got all the material deliveries. That means all the timber and the metal can come into the heavy workshops. So we're thinking as we're developing the adjacency of the departments, you've actually got the percolating, the cutting down of large bits of timber and metal that percolate up into the, st the workshops on the first floors and second floors of those materials cut down and moving up through the building. That really is really what's fundamental, and I think that seems to be working very well at the moment. Uh, Argent, the developers, the yellow area, is not part of Central St. Martins. The developer said, and 
again, it would be interesting your comments on this is, although Central St. Martin's aspirations were to have a public face, and I have to say we're dealing with this uh, both at, at, at two performance centres in London at the moment, everybody has an aspiration to have a public front, an, an engagement with the public, not just one hour before performance, but all day. Buildings have to earn money all day. So with this project, when Central St. Martins, and I have to say we did studies for Central St. Martins inhabiting all of that building and the Midland Shed and Good Shed, and in our early schemes we had, we had gymnasiums um, and it was a 24-7 campus. Money uh, didn't permit that and whether or not it was appropriate or not, uh, perhaps you can make your minds up on that. But Argent themselves, who are the developers, said we, because this, is a, this transit street is a very strong umbilical cord going from north to south of the site and south to north, they wanted that to remain uh, retail and office. So that is not part of Central St. Martins. And uh, Caravan have now taken that on as a cafe, a private cafe on the corner. So the students can use that as well. So we have the main uh, square, Granary Square, with a gallery for the college to that level. You then have a public route from east to west across the site. The public can all move through here. We have uh, display windows in all this area for the public to see the work that's going on. They can move through here. But once you move through that doors, you're in the domain of the university itself, the uh, college. And that's what we came up with. And I have to say, this is some working with Central St. Martins, but we played a fairly major part in that, in establishing uh, how different departments sit next to each other, how all those adjacencies work. Uh, bridges and performance links, to all the bridges are five metres wide. But what I was very pleased about, in the development of the scheme, we managed to convince the Estates Department I know, I, do you have an estates department here? Most probably not. An emerging one. An emerging one. Okay, estates department are the people that really talk about square meters, who owns what, who does what, and they're looking after the buildings. There was a uh, central St. Martins, basically all the spaces in all the buildings were just in the ownership of departments. What we said, if you've now got all these departments coming together, we have to create a large area of sh no longer space in ownership, but shared space. Now that demands a totally different culture and a different way of working. And we have managed to embed into this project large areas of shared space, not in ownership of departments, where students can just be, they can chill out, and they can actually talk and discuss projects with students from other disciplines. And that was the scheme that uh, we finally came up with. Here's the delivery of all the materials. So that's where all the workshops are, the cutting, the heavy workshops, I call it the sort of uh, airborne sound, uh, sounds, the hammering, the connection. And on the other side, we have the captured image, 2D, 4, 4D images. Um, so that's about captured image and sound on one side, airborne only and on the other side airborne but in impact as well and then we have this spine of possibility that was the brief that we had uh, from day one from uh, Central St. Martins that's how the building was in 1851 very sad in a way that actually that couldn't have been opened up but half of the sewers coming from Camden are going under there and there's no way that was going to be changed uh, Robert Townsend, who was a landscape architect we were working with on this project, developed the fountains that you would see in the square. They're all powered, actually, by photovoltaics that we put onto the roofs. But I think this is a very interesting image, and I'll come to that. In 1851, bags of grain would have been pulled up on winches on that facade. Boats would have gone in under, under these sort of uh, end transit sheds and that's where the grain would have been dropped down onto them in the sacks and taken off, as I said, to the bakers around London. That's where we are at the moment, and that's where the library and Central St. Martins are now inhabiting. What happened in the 18th, latter part of the uh, 19th century, the blue color space was fine, but they found there were no office spaces within the granary building. 
So these offices were built, uh, which I tried desperately to get rid of, so we could expose the um, original cubit transit shed elevations, which I thought would be much better, because it, they, by taking those offices away, the granary building maintains its ascendancy, because it is a stunningly beautiful building. That's what the transit sheds were like. You can see the canal coming through, and there were the boats, and that's where the, we would have had the grain being loaded onto them. That's the state of the granary building. Uh, cast iron, no bolts, all held up by friction, particularly. So this is where we arrived in 2005, 2006, looking at the projects and looking at the feasibility. This gorgeous graphics here that we kept very, uh, and uh, they're still there. No graphics were lost during the project. I think that's where we start talking about um, the benefit of holding on to history or not. I feel that a lot of regeneration projects um, destroy history in a way that uh, is um, unforgivable. For me, our history is as important as the future, and you know the future is strengthened by an understanding of the history. So for, for us at Stanton Williams, this project was much about understanding really the strength of the existing building, what we can work with, the power of it, the grain, the energy, the textures we talked about before, and then you juxtapose and you with that, and one hopes that that juxtaposition heightens the strength of both. These are all being kept, turntables, wherever possible. I think that's really interesting because it actually, again, represents a sort of historic energy of that movement of the trucks around the site. Whether or not you uh, consciously are aware of that, but I do feel architecture in terms of scars and history just touch things possibly subliminally of how we might experience a sort of enrich site. I don't apologize for this image. Um, I have to say I've designed a lot of Leonardo da Vinci shows around the world in my uh, younger days. And I'm always amazed by the way this organized drawing of Leonardo's anatomical drawings, how similar it is to how this amazing uh, uh, railway yard existed in the 1850s and latter part of the 19th century. There are many similarities in terms of how you think about how obviously things move within the body and how we move and trains moving backwards and forwards through the site. What's quite interesting is the bridges that are developed on our scheme at uh, King's Cross are quite similar in their positions to where the turntables were in the original uh, cubit scheme. So here now we're in the granary building, we've developed, we've created this light well in the middle of the scheme. This is the public area. Libraries on the first floor. And again, I think when we're looking at uh, historic buildings and you're working within existing buildings, and so we design art, uh, art installations around the world. The question with existing space is you have to understand what it can and can't do. You've got to understand exactly what it, its strengths and weaknesses are. I mean, I don't know, I, one can look at this and you can look at this room and you can decide whether or not it's a very good lecture room or not. Obviously, acoustically, you've got the issues about how you organize the position of the screen, the height of the room. Um, an example of that also for us is the bronze exhibition that I've just finished at the Royal Academy. I mean, it's finishing shortly, but we, we do those sort of exhibitions partly because it's a learning curve to understand really what spaces that exist, what is their strength, what is the magic. Um, but I would advise you when you're working on any existing building, you have to tell clients very early on what spaces can't do, not only what they can do, it's what they can't do. These are simple images that we've created. Now that, looking, looking to the south, there's the back of the granary building. And these were the assembly sheds that we took out. And that's where, when I mentioned about Camden, we are allowed to produce a building that didn't go effectively higher than the parapet building that existed on the site. So I don't know what you feel about that back facade, but obviously take the plants away. It's got a lot going for it. 
rationalise all the downpipes here. And that's a rather gorgeous facade. That was underneath that, uh, it, you know, we're now looking just at the ground level. The here, underneath that uh, assembly shed roof, that's the bottom of the facade, which you can see the roof uh, crashing into. So here we now have the uh, east-west link cratered. The roof's been taken away. We've left the uh, original, um, well, I, we call it scars, but also the paintwork that was painted internally underneath that roof in order to lighten up the space. All of that's been left, all the graphics have been left, all the, um, you can see here, obviously these are these areas, these engineering bricks that are there because vehicles would have moved in and out of them. But I think importantly, um, because historically the lifts of the building were within the floor plates to draw the grain up within the building, which was a later addition, we agreed with the planners that we could actually put lifts in on the, onto that facade that obviously takes students and staff up to the uh, uh, northern end of the building, although it's a listed building. When we're working with new and old, uh, I talked about juxtaposition of new and old. We spend a lot of time talking about um, the language of how, how materials touch. I think that uh, the sort of sensuality, what we really do get very excited about, I certainly get excited about, is whether a material touches another or whether material doesn't touch. And if you were to think about whether or not this, this cantilevered roof that's coming out from the new building, how different it would have been if it had engaged with that uh, historic elevation. So pulling the glass through, pulling this glazing through, allows that sort of relationship to take place, but it clearly defines what's new and what's old. Um, I think you hear the question with the glass is whether the glass slides down within the historic wall or actually sitting on the top of it. These are the sort of questions we ask of ourselves all the time. I think when we um, started this project, I think when you have a, a, a big project like this where you're inserting new into old, you also have to ask the question, what is the identity of the new within the old? Because the granary building itself has a very strong presence. Does Central St. Martins, the Weir's architects, actually create another elevation once you move inside? So all of those discussions about how important, what is the identity of Central St. Martins when you move through this building and uh, it's expressed to the uh, north. I mean, the lovely thing, coming back to the point I was making earlier, at the end of the day, you've got to trust that... Um, any client, obviously, uh, will see the potential of the space. I think here we have uh, the end-of-year fashion shows that were held within the East-West Link. Ironically, I'd assume the fashion shows were always going to be in the main street, but they decided to have it here, which is fantastic, because it takes on a very different nuance. Um, and Paul Smith, in the, the recent Fashion Week, chose Central St. Martin's this space for his... Uh, Fashion Week uh, fashion show as well, which I think is a testimony to the potential of the space. But you could start seeing here the sort of this concrete, this abstracted element that actually is an abstracted uh, entrance to Central St. Martin's itself. The roof here, this solid, actually folds down into the elevation. And we have on the walls, we have all the uh, theatre racks on here that means that uh, the college can project films onto the elevation as and when they want. Uh, for their first opening party, uh, again, I'm not sure how many of you went, uh, they were actually films being projected on there, so they are using all these spaces. But every wall, every elevation throughout the building has the potential to be projected on or to be exhibited on or used. Gives you an idea, just the details of the lift. Now we could have put in a, I have to say, a very contemporary modern lift, but we thought here that th that was really inappropriate, and it is a very functional, utilitarian lift. And again, coming back to the concerns of Central Saint Martin's, which is understandable. When I mean, it'd be interesting to know 
if the AA were to move from your buildings here and then you were to commission a new building, you know, what is the identity? What is the identity of the AA? You take away these buildings, which are these beautiful uh, period buildings. Where is the AA if you imagine being somewhere else? Where would you inhabit? Where would you feel is an easy fit for you? I'm not saying I have an answer to that, but that's the sort of question the Central St. Martins asked of themselves. A very edgy college, you know, they're in quite in, in various locations around London. How do you bring together all of those students and staff into one uh, environment they feel happy with? So, the street is interesting because we have the studio buildings either side and obviously we have suspended um, meeting spaces and studios above. They're not studios, they're meeting spaces above. You can see a five and a half meter wide bridge to the north. We designed this entrance that actually this is the, the balustrade from here can be unclipped and actually pavilions can be built out from there so we could have a stage projecting out a thrust stage coming out from the entrance rather like it could be a seven time pavilion built. Now in fact CSM, Central St. Martins, could have a different facade every year. Again, we were worried the fix of that move through into the street. It's nearly 14 metres wide. We always said the street is there to build things in. So the idea of pop-up structures could appear anywhere. Uh, cafes, um, we had the idea there would be coffee machines because we're dealing here with 4,500, 5,000 uh, people at any one time. Things must happen at any point. So any bridge here, tables are brought out and design sessions take place, either design workshops coming in from the east or from the west. That's just looking back towards the granary building itself. And this is just quickly. Now, what I'm interested in, um, and I'm sure Central St. Martins are, is when you take on space that's not in ownership, is who looks after that space. And what CSM are working with, because it was a huge move for them. I mean, it's a momentous move um, to, to um, relocate from nine buildings into one. They had last year, and they're now starting to form groups that start to animate and understand and program these bridges. At the moment, the students uh, take them on and do whatever they want in them but the, the intention is that uh, there are going to be proper programs for the bridges because they are being used. I'd always assumed there were going to be little p pods that were built in here so there would be tr transitional uh, identities going from uh, inside the street so there's the possible facades being built within these areas that they're talking about as well. But all the walls are all in the raw ply so that um, we, I had always assumed Central St. Martin's going to build, put soft walls and skins on top of that, that they can do whatever they wanted to. Again, they have just put artwork onto them and they've been left, so I'd be interested to see whether or not the uh, transformation that I talk about will take place or whether or not works of art stay like that for um, one year after the next or they start being allowed to be colonised and used by the students who are working the bridges. Here we have, this is an ETFE roof. The street is not an environmentally controlled space. What we've done is to, uh, all the excess heat from the studios are actually dumped into the street to um, warm it up in the winter. But we always said that for Central St. Martin to have this, um, it's nearly 150 metres, it's 180 metres long the building itself, but this is over 100 metres long the street that we couldn't environmentally control it. But if we created a roof over it, so there's no rain, um, would Central St. Martins use it? And of course, the fact is for most probably, uh, our engineers at Elia 10 have said possibly for 10 days of the year, it could either be too cold or too warm, but the rest of the time the, the space is uh, more than usable. 
We've used in situ concrete, uh, raw metalwork on all the treads, rather like the underground tube. Um, that within that environment, the sort of the uh, weathering takes place. And I, I would come back to something that, as a practice, uh, Stanton Williams, we um, we're passionate about materials, as I said, because of touch and uh, the sort of the uh, it it braces, it touches the senses. That we don't have any problem with weathering. Actually, we celebrate the weathering of materials. And uh, certainly Central St. Martin's is going to get hit. It's an art college. It, um, it's not intended to be um, precious in any way. But for me, the building will get better and better in terms of the levels of patina and the layers that start building up. And whether it's oil paint or what, it, uh, it now needs to feel lived in. That is, shows, again, new and old, the old wall running through the building. Uh, not leaving the texture of the walls and the paint on the brickwork uh, for us was a very easy decision to take. But again, new and old, uh, having a dialogue with each other. That's in the canteen and aware of a possible drawing light down into the building. It's interesting about the drama. We talk about many different types of spaces for um, uh, performance. The biggest discussion that went on with Central St. Martins and their team was whether or not the theatre should have a fly tower or not. Um, obviously, fly towers allow for the um, students to experiment with the gear and the gizmos that go on in fly tower, but the fly tower takes up a huge amount of additional square meters at these upper levels and the discussion went on for well over a year within CSM, it's nothing to do with uh, Stanton Williams, whether or not the fly tower was appropriate or whether or not CSM went and hired a proper theatre space as and when they wanted the fly tower but they said no this must be a first class world class theatre and so they have a full blooded fly tower in the, uh, these are all bleacher seatings that can all be tucked away and so they can have uh, a flat performance space as and when they want. And these are just some of the spaces that we have, raw, concrete, it really is just warehouse spaces here. This is at the top of the transit shed, the fashion studios. Fine art studios. fashion again. I'm fascinated by this, we actually created this um, large um, terrace to the um, east on the top of the transit shed and you can see these are that, that area which has the uh, photovoltaics on that are actually powering the fountains in the square but that's the space where the outdoor exhibition space can be and here's the terrace. Now. I will admit to the fact that the um, terrace at the moment is not open to the students because they deem it to be a health and safety risk. Now, I'd be interested to know your comments on that. You know, there are, you know, here we are. I mean, whether we're, at what age you become sensible, but for me, when you go to our college, you're a fairly reasonable, sensible adult. Um, you could jump off the roof if you wanted to, but one wonders how many other potential bridges there are in London where you could do that. But at Central St. Martin's, the health and safety office is the same. Now, there's big discussions going on as to whether or not it has to be enclosed anymore. Now, they have used it, and they'll use it for... Uh, it's designed to have pavilions put on covered areas uh, and entertaining going on. But you as a student, if you were there at the moment, you will only have prescribed hours uh, when you can go into there and you're going to be watched by Big Daddy. I beg his belief, frankly. I mean, I'm not sure where health and safety goes, but um, you can go to many of the colleges around London which have terraces just like this. But at the moment, I think it's seemed to be that CSM students are too willful um, that I'm not sure what they might self-harm up there. I have no idea. Now, just coming back to the, um, the south-facing facade, there's the Granary Building. These are the offices that um, 
were put on in the 1890s. And you can see poor old Cubitt's um, transit shed popping through there. You can see one of those arches that are in that watercolour that I showed earlier. Uh, what we have developed now, because we couldn't take that down, we have actually developed uh, a screen and we bought through a contemporary element that fills that space in. Um, I hope this slide work. We had... Is it going to work? Hey oh dear. Can you, could you, have we, could you just... I just want to get these films. They've gone. They were working. You had them working earlier. I've got another question. When you... Uh, the ongoing debate while we were working on the inside of Central St. Martin, Again, you, can, you have the same references here to your building. Is what should a facade? No, 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 it's not that. <laughs> you got to go back. Yeah. That one. That one. I think it's interesting. Uh, is what's the identity for an art college? What is the identity for um, Central St. Martin? This one. It is this one. I hope it's just not this woman's legs walking down. But anyway, um, it's got no. No. And there. Uh, what we were well, clearly it's not. Can you can you try and get the um, PowerPoint? Go back to PowerPoint. You did something when they they were working earlier on there. Yeah. Mm, that was trouble. Uh, you can't just them. get back to that one. to work on a, a very fine LED mesh screen that we could actually stretch across the front of that and float in front of the building that would allow for um, images to be projected and the students could actually use that as a vehicle to express their work on the front of the building. We had everybody's permission, including Camden, but English Heritage uh, were of the view that... Um, the building with allowing something as abstract as that would detract from the historic um, nature and set a precedent for other historic buildings around the country. So we had a long battle that went on for weeks and weeks and weeks on that and finally English Heritage finally said no. Argent, who were the developers uh, with Central St. Martins, had agreed that they would set up a um, proper committee that would um, monitor all the images and everything going out and broadcast on this screen, but it was still rejected by um, English Heritage, so we were never able to do it, which is uh, a huge shame. I think in time, Central St. Martins will go back with Argent, and there will be this fine veil of LED screens put over the building in order to... Uh, Engaged because the beautiful thing is there's a boulevard that goes from uh, the south of King's Cross, the back of King's Cross Station, up to the Granary Building, and it would be a fantastic uh, image. Not the density of um, uh, Piccadilly. It's not. It's not that sort of Coca-Cola. Right? It's a much more refined uh, LED screen that we'll be dealing with. That you would able. You were able to see the sort of uh, texture of the historic building behind. Anyway, here we have the Western Transit Sheds, and you can see that, uh, those derelict images earlier. That's what it now looks like. We've inserted, we've opened up a number of the arches. Now, a detail that you know, we would um, we spend a lot of time over, if you imagine that was once upon a time just a solid brick arch, and clearly we needed um, light to come into this building. Now, you either make a decision to take all of that out on both of those, which means you have a finer column just coming down uh, here between the next one. 
What I was concerned about that we still held on to a certain amount of solid in order to allow the brickwork to not maintain its ascendancy but seriously have it make its presence felt. So this actually comes in on all of these, we leave that brickwork and actually create shoulders and we then form this datum that is on the other side of the building where all the retail is, that's where all the shop fronts are. So these are the office units on the other side as well as Central St. Martin's, this is where the fashion studios are. But for me, these sort of moves are key to uh, the historic building holding on to its integrity. So the northern end of the building, I mean, beautiful nostrils here, I mean, you can't take those out. It's turned into that, so we've left all of these. On the uh, other side, the other transit shed where the offices are, we have actually taken that out and restored, got as much light in as possible. So the interventions in the historic element where we have central St. Martin's keeps as much of the historic elements as possible. I think that's, uh, this is the dance studios cantilevered around the um, uh, uh, flight tower, and that's the space at night time. And that's the dance studios. Now I finish with one, um, that, well that gives you an idea, uh, program, Base build started in 2008, completed in March 2011. The fit out, which was unbelievably quick, and that we were not involved in the fit out. It was done by um, the contractors were a company called Overbury, and because it's a design and build contract, the fit out was done by Pringle Brandon. But they had nigh on six months, so they were spending a um, million pounds a week. I mean, it was just absurd, uh, quick to develop that. Anyway, as you can see here, it, that's when it opened the student in 2011. Now, have you, can, you, can we just have this final film? It's our dream for three or four what years. And while without we are here, we need to... all of this and all the pain of getting the fit out, said we were sort of once removed from that. I then heard that the students were offered the building to have a... And what's great party. about St. Martin's is meeting people. Uh, it's our dream for three so or four years. And while we are here, we need to profit of being a St. Martin student. It's just it kind of gives you freedom. motivation to, to, go it, to go out there and do what you like. Uh, turn it it's a lifestyle. I mean, this new building it. is probably the thing that we're celebrating tonight, isn't it? It's just a wonderful place to be at. It's just very exciting. There's, it's a hub of creativity. It's a building. It's genius. Yeah, it's nice to come and christen the place. So the question, you know, we have a lot of performance spaces. So the question is how the can performers come out into different the street? Languages, different nationalities, different way of learning, it's a different way of life. Creativity, the fun, the joy, the commitment everyone gives to their cause. No, it's got history and heritage. I can't think of a better place to work, really. The fact that we're all a big family and it's all disparate people, you know, we, we come from all over the place. I'm a square peg in a round hole, like most people here. crazy things and doing whatever they want and it's kind of like a limitless We had nothing to do with selecting furniture in the United States. It's nice to have everyone all in one CSM actually had to because of the money. What collaboration going on now that we're all in one building and um, I think that kind of the money going to be lots of pollination in the future. Uh, with people realising much more you know, about other professions they will throw um, and, um, and other courses, what they're doing, and getting and wanting to get involved. And I think the, the boundaries of uh, design will be blurred. It's a new beginning. You can't define it, but it's there. And you only ever recognise it when you see it. With all of these films that were projected, again, you know, what I think is wonderful, you know, the building is no longer ours, we've got nothing to do with it now, is that it's taken on. You know, and this whoever decided to put the lights up on day one, Central St. Martin can take the building wherever they want. It is up to them, it's up to the staff and students. And uh, I think what we were hoping 
just as architects are said of having pulled back. But our view was that uh, identities of different departments who were inhabiting different buildings, whatever this building is now, each department must be allowed to create its own identity within. And I think, well, time will tell. I have no idea whether CSM, where, where they take it. But it's different to a lot of other projects, with, say with the Sainsbury. Um, it is very much a completed building where we have the furniture everywhere, uh, all the threshold to lighting, we've conceived everything. This one, quite the opposite. Anyway, thank you. Because I mean, you, you were mentioning how this is one of the sort of biggest, you know, undeveloped sites in central London. Um, do you think w were you kind of uh, involved w at, at that stage um, when those sort of decisions were being made, or um we weren't? Obvi obviously, the, the the 67 acres is owned by a, a consortium, one of which is Argent. And as I say, you could saw the list of buildings that are going to be built, but it is a it is a privately owned and it's going to be a privately run site, just like Broadgate or, mm. you know, with the Fogo buildings and the Arab buildings that are there at the moment. I think the, the, your point, I mean, if it's a worry, I mean, I worry about the sort of Big Brother aspect. Um, there is a large square there, and Argent uh, intend to have a very light touch. Uh, the one area that it, I've been on record as saying this already, that uh, I'm a strong believer in the sort of vague terrain, you know, that's a very fashionable word at the moment, but I totally support the idea that you have to allow uh, sort of zones of wilderness almost within any side. And for me, one of those zones of wilderness in London are, are canal paths. I absolutely adore, you know, you think differently there, you know, you, your head enters another world. Mm -hmm. And the umbilical cord of the sort of the canal that runs through King's Cross, unfortunately Argent have actually put bound gravel onto the, uh, the little bit of towpath that runs through. For me that's a, a travesty. And those are the sort of things when you talk about, uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, in ownership, as it were, or privately, um, it is. But Argent's intention is to keep it as light touch as possible. Um, but time will tell. Hello, I have uh, two questions. My first question is about um, the back of the building, it's like a frosted frosted glass on on mm -hmm. the. On, yeah, on the back, why frosted and not just clear, very simply? Because there's going to be office buildings uh, built very close to it in uh, a very short period of time. And there's going to be a lot of dancers and, you know, the sort of the privacy of dancers, whether, you know, however scantily clad. Um, we did ask Central St. Martins about that, whether they w wanted the privacy or not. And uh, the view was it was inappropriate to have an office building cheek to jowl with dance studios with um, whoever it might be looking at the students working in a, in a fairly intimate um, uh, performances. So there wasn't, there wasn't like the possibility of having a, a glass window but then having an internal, I don't know, shutter or something. Um, I'm just wondering uh, why, because I'm I'm a student at Central St Martin's, and you would have liked to, you would have liked clear well glass out. Yeah, I personally, every support that. well, every time we are in the those rooms, you know, alongside um, the carpet spaces in there, you know, it's just extremely frustrating when you have sunlight, and you can't, you're not really, it's not coming through, but you know it's there. So it makes it feel almost more claustrophobic than it, 
you know. Uh, but you feel, no, I, I'm not going to disagree with you. I can understand that, but it was a decision by mm. um, the university because we asked that question. Mm. In fact, uh, we had parts that were clear and parts that were translucent at one stage. Okay. Um, I mean, it's an interesting idea, though, that, you know, once you start putting curtains up, whether or not the curtains are continually drawn, and then, you know, what does the facade start looking like? It's, it's trying to hold on to a quality there. I mean, it's interesting that quite a few of the uh, studios um, at the other end of the building, facing the uh, Granary building, the north end, mm -hmm. um, within a month were blocked in and they were blocked in with hardboard and you know they were just jammed up against the glass without any any understanding of the impact it has on the building itself mm. right? but i'm not going to disagree i mean i i most probably in your position i would be thinking the same yeah um but they can always change you know the, the silly thing is those um this the these regular glass blocks are bloody easy to change so if you, you know, there's, there's possibilities there. They're in there at the moment. They're not the easiest thing to take out. But, uh, okay, they're quite not big. in my lifetime but anyway. They're perhaps <laughs> not in your lifetime, but yeah. all of those things are interchangeable. Mm. But you could imagine, I mean, the, the, the building is going to be, I'm not sure how many stories bigger than your building, but it will be there to there. It's, Interesting. you know, very much in your face. Uh -huh. the, and you, I would guarantee you're, you would have the... Um, curtains closed most of the time. Mm. Um, another question I have is um, what you said about uh, that, that you know, the, the university can take the building wherever they want now. Um, however, I f like being a student inside the building, we don't actually, we understand that that's a possibility, but we don't actually feel that that we can take it where we want, not only because of what you were saying about health and safety, um, but also, uh, you know, the grand structure of the building is so, um, it, it's so much to take in when you're, when you're actually in there, that, um, and also the contrast between what it was at, say, Southampton Row in the, in the Holborn building, um, or even at Charing Cross, the, the feel is so um, now so grand and uh, and so open that actually students don't feel very comfortable to to express themselves as they did before. Um, so I'm because just wondering because what because of the um, why why because, because of being watched because it's because it's so it's so open but and you're only talking about the street. I mean, there and are that many, is the main, the there are main many, many areas in the building. I mean, you know, there are all sorts of different types of spaces. Mm. Huge number of different types of quality of space, whether the old, the new, the studios, the... Um, but you can choose where, I mean, yeah. the street is the street, I would agree that. But you've got to remember that the street is actually bringing in the daylight. You I'm just you wondering how, how, how did you imagine that it, um, it, that it would be possible um, to, to take for the school to take uh, to take it wherever it wanted to go, like I'm wondering well, I'm not how quite, you. Yeah, okay. I'm not quite sure where. It, obviously, it's not for me to say where to go. But I, mm. the first thing I do is to start building things in the street. I would start having the pop-up architecture. I, that would have happened on day two for me, mm. you know. And you commissioned, you know, they're not expensive. You could do it in paper. Mm. You know, it, it's done all around. It's all done all around London. It's not hugely expensive. And you could be building small little buildings there. You can start creating your own. <coughs> you know, it's just taking it on. It's having the balls just to say, yeah. look, we're going to do this. And then, you know, you could have a floor. You could have it at the top. And, you know, the, you can actually use it as another elevation to actually have children looking down on. So you've got another projection area. Well, it's those sort of areas yeah. in the bigger spaces. In the studios, well, you know, they are, if you go into a warehouse anywhere, you know, I've just finished a, 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 an exhibition in Berlin at the moment for Bridget Riley. Yeah. You know, it's a warehouse, no different to what you've got. I and everybody's well celebrating all of that. You know, it can't be, you can't say, uh, you know, warehouses are, it's got to be right for an art village, isn't it? 
Yeah, but it, I think it just comes down then because, of course, the possibilities are there, but um, you know, without the, uh, the the tick from health and safety, then it's absolutely. Well, I don't think the tick on the, the pop up has got anything to do with it. We're talking about that terrace, I mean, I. Uh, no, so actually, I inside, no, we. We, I mean, as a student of performance design, who's constantly wanting to be to be yeah. in that street, that uh, every time we are presenting an idea, that it's uh, almost uh, seventy to eighty percent rejected because um, because of you know that it's a it's a fire hazard or really ridiculous. They make really ridiculous objections um, uh, that allow us that don't allow us to to actually fulfill the, the full potential of our ideas, so... But you, can you help, well, yeah, it's not for me to say, mm. but, you know, that's, it's management. But it's just, yes, it's, it's just a constant, it's a it's constant management. battle, though, you know, so but it's very, you know... I think, you know, it's going to take time, and I think your the management, they've delivered a building like this, it's their, mm. they're the ones now that have got to free it up for you to do the sort of things that you want to do. Mm. It's wrong if that's being if you're being thwarted all yeah. the time. But the it's swipe really cards are another one, aren't they? Let's not go there. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, yes, that's it's another one that was never intended. But that, that's yeah. being um, there's interesting. The um, we had again Santa Williams. We pulled away quite a while. When the building opened, there were swipe cards to get. I don't. You have them here, do you, in the building to get into different parts of the uh, normal buildings? If you have a uh, if you went into a serious building, there might be ten different zones. Central St. Martin started with 70, I think, something mm. like this, which yeah. was amazing. But, you know, this is uh, the first year they're learning, and I gather now that uh, the, your new uh, Jeremy Till has sort of released all of that. It's got easier this year, has it? Yeah, much, much better, but um, anyway. It's still it's an issue. Yeah, and it, it's good to hear your, your point of view, so thank you. Thanks for the lecture. Um, I'm more interested in the process, actually related to the last question maybe. Uh, I know you have a minimum requirement for the studio space for each department, as well as your own uh, priority of the street uh, requirement. And is there a point that uh, after you see the uh, completion, whether the space is too big or too small, or whether there are studio that you found it because I did come across like on the, on the from newspaper that students found um, not enough studio space um, to open and then for the street, which is fair um, approach from from your point of view because you want you want people to create a pop up store. Is that like a process that, for example, like you 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 did make a model with a, I don't know a seven time uh, pavilion that you can line up five for that that you know to 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 get idea how big is the street is. Uh, but I just feel more interested in the process, the negotiation when you design the private as well as the semi-private and then the public space. Well, um, obviously before we uh, start on any project, uh, you have what's called space utilization studies done. And um, Central St. Martins were had that study done and it was um, deemed to have far too much space in their nine buildings. Or should we say they could do with much less. And of course that comes from a culture of X number of square meters with rooms empty for could be a day at a time. You know, it because nobody's using it and certainly, you know, I spent many years walking around Central St. Martins actually working and uh, working on a number of projects in a number of departments. Huge number of rooms empty all the time. I'm not sure about the AA. But the, the space utilization was something like 18% of use. I mean, beggar's belief, right? 22, 82% uh, of the, uh, the spaces are empty. But the staff were saying we need more space. Now, you know, clearly there's an issue there. So what happened on C CSM? the university did the studies and said, well, we're going to change the culture here. We bring everybody together and you then have to have bookable rooms. Well, w you know, understandably, if you've been teaching, I mean, I don't know if there are any tutors here in the room, 
you've been teaching in a way for the last 20 odd years and suddenly somebody says well you're now going to book a room when you want to and you go well bloody hell you know why I don't want to book a room I want when my students I've got a group I want to just go somewhere and that's a big shift and CSM are asking to do that partly in order to be more sustainable because if you've got all this space you've got to you know you have it's cost more and they're trying you know economy and it, it's a different way of working that's that's one point in terms of um, appropriateness of space I mean you can the the, the cohorts of different because um, um, I, I, I don't actually have an answer to this but uh, teaching numbers in, in classrooms change from of 30 down to 5 down to so they're ever morphing so all we have ever said and I have to coming back we produce the uh, framework each department over time because cohorts change um, they will within they have to have money given to them in order to build the walls or the framework or put the acoustics in in order to um, deliver the type of spaces they want for that year and as Jane Rapley said whatever they are on day one we will want to change it and rip it down so all the walls in the building but obviously the concrete structure and framework is soft. You can take it all out, <coughs> it's timber soft, and they can be moved and moved around or just knocked out and opened up. That's the premise we started and then on, and then the college come along and build whatever they want. So it could never, it's not an exact science. All we ever did is to say, well, you can have a four metre high ceiling, which was agreed, and it is a warehouse type structure. All the services, none of them can be um, uh, hidden, so they're all exposed. And it is just like walking into a warehouse and you you build your own. It all, should all be temporary. So it's, if, when you come from a culture though that's been in a building for 10 years and you've never changed anything, it's, de it's demanding. It's demanding this building. It demands a different way of, you know, people sitting there and saying, come to me, just do it for me. People have got to come up with ideas <coughs> for doing things. Because whatever they're saying today, somebody else will be saying something very different tomorrow. They've got to sort that out. I mean, it's not me. I shouldn't be talking like this. Yeah. This, is, this should be somebody from Central Center. So I'm on very dodgy ground here, but... Um, mm. You know, th that's the idea. It is really putting a lot of weight and emphasis onto the users. They drive it. It's asking a lot. But why not? It's a bloody creative art college, for Christ's sake. I mean, you know, if it's a bunch of accountants, I'd buy that. They might say, here's your chance, CSM. Go for it. And I, you know, the problem is, is the layers of um, restrictions that might be dumped on it. But hey, don't shoot the you know I don't shoot the messenger here. I, I would say for me, they've got to find ways around um, uh, giving you the full freedom to do whatever you want within the, and you've got to fight for that. And Vladimir and whoever, all your team, you've got to be out there. I think it's scandalous. I have to say the the terrace is just a travesty. It just your heart sinks to think that you've got a, the biggest terrace in London. Uh, I'm not really into size normally, but you know, it's a bloody big terrace. You could do fantastic things up there, and you're not allowed on there. Travesty. <laughs> Travesty, yeah. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh,